beautiful truths that have been sung about this morning. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for making me look good. <laughs> okay, kind of good. <laughs> I, don't know. I thank the Lord that uh, everything that we've sung about, and it's like a direction, you know. We can face the storms of life, and, and the storms of life, the winds want to push us maybe against where God wants us to go, but the anchor says, no, 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 I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to keep you pointed in the direction I'm pointing you. You be faithful, and I will get you through this storm. I will get you through the storm. I don't know. It was just irony or what. My uh, daughter and I, we were watching, and my son were uh, uh, watching a documentary of uh, a young boy. He was 17 years old. I think his name was Jesse that sailed around the world. you remember that? About 10 years ago, the youngest person to sail around. And, and we watched this thing, and, and to see this young boy, 17, he turned 18 while he was out there. Uh, to sail around the world, and one uh, set of storms three days in a row, just battering the boat, and battering, and he would video himself, and he was just breaking down. Here was a little boy that was crying, a young man crying out, just crying, because after three days of the storms, it just, it wears on you, and sometimes the world is that way. It will wear on you, but praise the Lord, his anchor will hold, and he will keep us pointed in the right direction, you know? I suppose, uh, uh, well, let's just go right to the, our, our scriptures this morning. This is found in Joshua chapter 3. We'll be reading uh, the first 17 verses this morning. Joshua chapter 3, and we're talking about crossing over the sea, going around the world. This is talking about crossing over. I can't get out of Joshua, but this is the third chapter. So we, we've gone through the first two chapters, so we're in the third chapter since October, we, we've, every once in a while, the Lord just keeps bringing me back to this book. So early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left uh, Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Le Le Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of our Lord, the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, Purify yourselves for tomorrow. See, that was for dramatic effect. That was good, Mark. Thank you. Purify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites, and any other ites that's ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priest will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of the water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. No man did that. So the people left then, camped to cross the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. It was a flooding. It was in a flood stage. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. 
Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the ark of the Lord's covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. And lastly, they waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Lord, I thank you again for your precious presence here this morning. I don't want to get in your way, Holy Spirit. I just pray you continue to, to do your mighty work. Would you, will you use me again? Will you, will you just help me to deliver uh, your message for this hour, Lord, this day? And I ask these things in your precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I suppose most of you could tell a story or two about trying to travel to a place that you had never been to before. And you've tried getting there, and maybe you just didn't have the adequate directions. Now, maybe that's more of a man thing. I don't know. But it happened to me several times in my life where, where I went to a place, and, and I knew where I was going. And, and I've never considered poor directions uh, or a lack of directions to be a particular problem. or a, For me, anyway, I have no big deal, you know? I mean, if I have an address of a basic location then or, or something, I always figure out, you know, I'll figure out how to get there. I'll figure it out. I'll eventually find the place that I'm going to. Now, I know, I guess it's something like uh, maybe more of me and, and a man I like a challenge uh, or, or uh, that sense of adventure. My idea of adequate direction is, say, uh, uh, let's go to Wrigley Field, and it's in Chicago. Well, that's good enough for me. If I go to Chicago, surely I'll find Wrigley Field. I mean, how could I miss it? It's, it's in Chicago. Because this in mind, you know, I, I know that enjoying a challenge, uh, my wife, on the other hand, she, she just doesn't enjoy that kind of a challenge. You know? Amazing as it seems, my wife seems to, to want more of directions. She wants to know every little stop sign, stop light, turn. Is that, you ladies, is that something that you're, Okay, you know, you know, I'm not confessing. I'm not, I'm not here. Uh, she's that way. And I was reminded of this that lately, or, well, a little several years ago, on a journey that we took. We went to Universal Studios. Now, I'd been to Universal several times. I'd been in there, and I got out of there, and I got home. No problems. Well, this particular night, we came out, and I know where I was going. I didn't have a GPS or anything. I knew where I was going. Well, when you know what, they sent me out another way. It was like one time going to Orlando Airport, and I came out the backside. I don't know where I was, something called Boggy Creek Road, which now I know goes every which direction. But anyway, that was what I felt like. And, you know, I was like, I'm going to get us home. I'm going to get us home. And I'm driving all around in the, in, at night, and it's not that used to Orlando at that time, and trying to get out of, out of Orlando and get on, find four. Surely there's a sign over here that says something about four. Now, can you, you probably can imagine what my wife was saying. <laughs> Why don't you just pull over and ask for directions? What? I don't, I'm a, I don't need to ask for directions. I'll get us home, you know. Matter of fact, I was, uh, this happened to me at Disney before, too, now that I think about that. But anyway, to be honest with the situation, we were lost. Okay, I, <laughs> I was lost. All I was trying to do was to get us home. You know what she was saying to me? And as she said that, I'm like, no, I'm going to get us out of here. I'm going to find us, you know? And I think that just demonstrates how just little you wives understand about these things. But I, I was, and you probably think it's because, you know, I, I want to just, didn't want to pull over. I, I didn't want to get out or I didn't ask. And that's not the point. That wasn't the point. It's I'm a man. It's the principle of the thing. I'm the man. I'm going to get us home. Don't worry, baby. We'll make it. Well, that was quite an experience, and it was amazing. You know, it's amazing how often that we get lost in life. It's amazing sometimes that we try to find our own way when we think we know where we're going. And now, and just not just in uh, terms of location, but trying just to survive our lives, trying to do the, the proper things. Each of us is probably guilty of trying to make it on our own and trying to, to make it when we really needed help, but we didn't ask for help. We didn't search or seek for the help. Well, we find that in the first two chapters of Joshua and how the nation of Israel was trying to finally cross over into what God had promised them. We've discovered some truths, at least I hope so, that have, have applied to our own lives. 
We're taking this story as a kind of metaphor for our own spiritual journey. And sometimes we feel like we're like this, like in the desert in our journey. And we've realized God's called every one of us into a relationship with him, into new land, spiritually speaking, and perhaps even in a call that he's placed upon our lives. He's called us to leave this desert of our own making and to cross over into a life of freedom, into a life of joy, into a life of peace. Yet, through, and even though we have this promise from God in this great new land, this wonderful place to go and inhabit, many Christians just find themselves wandering around in the desert, wandering around in a place where God doesn't even want you. He wants you to experience something wonderful. And because of our own desire to be in control, we end up wandering around in the desert. We camp, unfortunately, and, and we start camping out on the wrong side of the river, unable to cross into what God wants us to experience. And sometimes it's the past that keeps us from crossing over. Sometimes it's fear that we've seen a little bit ago that we've talked about. Sometimes it's fear that keeps us from crossing over. And yet we've heard the Lord, the Lord of Israel say, it's time to get up, it's time to dust yourself off, and it's time to get moving, moving in the direction that I'm pointing you. Stop allowing your future to be defined by your past. We've heard him say, don't be afraid because I've already gone on before you. I've prepared the way and I've removed those barriers that lay in front of you. I've made you a path. Joshua and his officials define the problem very clearly and concisely here. Even though he, God's saying it's time to go, there was still a problem. And here was the problem. Joshua and his officials are saying, listen, you have never been this way before. How can you go where I want you to go when you don't know where you're going? You need help. You need directions. In other words, you don't have adequate directions. And it's not good enough to think you can just get there all on your own, just somehow, and just figure it out. Also, you can't make it on your own. You need help. You need my help. I think it's just another mirror image of our spiritual lives. Perhaps for one reason, some of us, or another, some of us are ready to cross over into God's new land, ready to cross over into God's promises, but we, we, we want to do it on our own, you know? Or, you know what? I want to go over there. I want to get over into what you want me to do, and I've, but I've tried it already, Lord. I tried it, and it was tough. It was hard, and I got lost. So we give up. We give up. Once we start the journey, we try to go our own way, and instead of doing it on Jesus' terms, we try to do it on our own terms, and we got lost. We hear God's call to go deeper, in our spiritual lives, and immediately we think, okay, yeah, I, I can do that, okay, yeah, I can get deeper, I, I can get more, more, give you more, Lord, I can give you more of a, I know the way, I know how to do this, when really we don't. I've realized we don't. Yes, the call is there to go deeper. Yes, the desire should be within us to be obedient, to go deeper, to be obedient to whatever God's calling us to do, but the truth is, we don't know the way. Or if we've tried and we failed, we don't want to try it again. So the problem is when God calls us to something new and deeper in our life in him, we can't just strike out on our own. We don't know the way. We've never been this way before. So I'm going to give you an example. Sometimes maybe we sense God's inner call to deepen our lives in spiritual disciplines. Maybe he's asking you to pray more. Maybe he's asking you to read his word more. Maybe he's asking you to give more in, in tithes or offerings. Maybe he's asking you to something to get deeper, you see. And, and you know if you do this, you're going to become closer to him. You will become closer, so it sounds good. It feels good. But then when we think of, to do it, we think, okay, well, I can do this. But so I think some of the problem is we just do it individually. And, and, and I'm not going to tell anybody in case I fail. I, I'm going to, you know, God, I know you're calling me to read one more verse every night or one more chapter every night. Okay, I could do that. Instead of saying, you know what, 
I, I'll probably, I, I'm going to have trouble with that. I, I'm, I'm going to tell somebody, hey, listen, brother, Bernie, I am going to, uh, God's calling me to, to, to read more of his word. Will you keep me accountable? Will, will, every once in a while, would you ask me how that's going? Ooh. What I've realized and reading, going through a chronological reading of the Bible in a year, some of you that may be friends with me on Facebook, every once in a while I'll post where I am in my reading. At first, for the first 200 days, I thought, no, that's crazy when the people are doing that. I felt like that was like, look at me, I read 200 days in a row, you know, and I'm like, oh, I can't do that, Lord. I, I, I got to make sure I'm doing this right. And then be, the Lord began impressing on me, I want you to post that. I'm like, why in the world? You want me to post that I'm, I'm on day 300 and whatever. Why would you want me to do that, Lord? And then I realized, uh-oh, now I've got friends saying, hey, I haven't seen you post lately. Are you still reading the word? How you doing on that chronological reading? Oh, my. Now I get it, Lord. Now the whole friends are watching. You see, I'm accountable. And, and, and when I'm really tired and I don't feel like reading that night, I'm thinking like, oh, wait a minute. If I don't, I know so-and-so goes, hey, <laughs> I didn't see your post. Did you read the Bible last night? You see, there's something about this accountability thing that helps us. But it's tough. It's tough to be accountable to, to other people because we're individualistic. I want my way. I want to do it my way. I don't want somebody to, to come in and, and ask me how I'm doing and check up on me. You know, we, re we reject uh, receiving these spiritual directions from others. We think that we know better. We know the way. But we really don't always, not always, and pretty soon we make compromises. Pretty soon we put the Bible down. Pretty soon we don't pray. Pretty soon we make wrong turns because God has called us to this and we began something and we've quit it and we begin going a different direction. The anchors say, hey, listen, I'm holding, I want you to go this way, but you're going that way. You know, we do, there's, there should be never quit in us. There should never be quit in us in this relationship. We quit. Because we don't have that accountability sometimes. The simple truth is that when God calls us to a new land, we need help. I need your help. See, as a pastor here, you, you learn real quick, I'm not doing this on my own. I can't do this on my own. I am not a power-hungry person. I am a team leader. I am your leader. But I need you. Because without you, the church is going to fail and it's going to fold. doesn't matter how good or bad my messages are. doesn't matter how good the music is or bad the music is. It's not going to matter. It's us. It's the team. It's the church. It's the body that makes the difference in God's world, in this world that he's created. We need each other. And we need a navigator whenever we, whether we want to admit it or not. We need that navigator. Well, Joshua 3 is simple. A simple yet powerful story of how God used these people and he showed these people the way. There are three actions that these people were called to. First, they were called, they were called to follow God. Follow God by following the ark of the covenant. The way they do that, they followed. They were being obedient. You want to follow me? Yes. God says, okay, then I want you to do this. Be obedient. For the Israelites, it was follow the ark of the covenant, the symbol and the center of God's presence with his people. Now we have his Holy Spirit. It's interesting that in chapters three and four that the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned no less than 17 times. In two chapters, when I'm seeing it that many times, it must be important. God's presence is important. It's as if, it's if, it is as if the writer is trying to make sure we don't lose sight of it. He was telling the people, but the writer is to remind us, we don't lose sight of it. And there's a lesson here. If you lose sight of God, you're sunk. If we lose sight of the Creator, if we lose sight of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're sunk individually and corporately. In other words, if you lose sight of the goal, if you lose sight of all the religious activity, if, if you lose sight of what God is calling you to do and what God is calling you to be, all the activity is worthless. It isn't worth anything. If you lose sight of the Father, you end up wandering in the desert, no matter what you call it. 
following God on this journey in a new land, it sounds reasonable. It sounds like, well, sure, I'll follow God. That's not hard. I, it's obviously the right thing to do. I, I can do that. The crazy thing is often that God, when he calls us to do something and he leads us in directions, he takes us in like different directions than we think we, would, we should go. You know, I'm thinking this is the way I should go, God. God said, uh-huh, I want you to go this way. Yeah, well, that don't make sense. <laughs> Wait a minute, who's in control here? Whether it makes sense or not, who's in control? God is going to lead his people, and he was going to lead his people over the Jordan River. I love this fact. It shows that God leads in different directions than what we think is logical. He was going to lead them, but he was going to lead them at a time when the river was in flood stage. That's just crazy. Come on, God, we've been in the desert for 40 years. Can't you wait three more months until the water goes down? No. <laughs> I don't work that way. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us according to the way we would do things. We, have you ever noticed God just has a way of doing that, working things out that way? He just has a way about, about himself, and he looks at it different than what we do. When it's time to cross over, God will take us. God will ask us, and he will help us, and he will ask us sometimes to do some crazy things. He might ask us to have a contemporary service. Hmm. He may ask us to do Sunday school at night. He may ask, no, nah, I'm not just coming up with that stuff. But you understand what I'm trying to say, I hope? See, it ain't about me. It ain't about the board. It ain't about you. It's about God and what God is asking us to do as a body of believers. What are we here for? For a country club? Come on in. Put your sticker on. Okay, you're a member. You're good. Or are we to be reaching out? With a visitor like we have this morning. I hope you went up and shook her hand. I hope you went up and if she let you hug her neck, maybe she's not a hugger, that's okay. You shake her hand or you bow to her or whatever it is, you know. We want to let the people know we are glad you are here. Because in about us. See, God makes us uncomfortable. And he asks us sometimes to do things that we just don't want to do or don't like to do. This is the issue, though. Will you follow? This is his question. Will you follow? Whether it sounds crazy or not, even if it looks to be against common sense, will you follow God and try to, instead of trying to find your own way? There's a second action these people are called to. Joshua went through the camp and told the people this. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. To consecrate is to set yourself apart, to sanctify yourself, to make holy. There is a special preparation called on the part of the people here in this story. There's also a special part that's called to on our part that God calls us to. He wants our hearts clean. He wants them clean of sin. He wants to be the one that lives here only. And he wants to reveal himself in an extraordinary way. And he was about to, but first they had to obey. First follow God, and then ask for forgiveness. Follow God, I believe you. Okay, you said to do this. Okay, I'm ready to follow you. What do you want me to do next? I want you to ask for forgiveness. Okay. Please forgive me of my sins. Consecrate me. Set me apart, Lord. Make me something that's usable. Pliable I am. Make me. Use me for your glory. Use me for whatever it is you want to do. I don't care. Here I am. Sanctify me. Make me holy. Set me apart that I can be so special in your kingdom because it's about your kingdom and it ain't even about this kingdom. It's about the kingdom to come. And until you come, I need to be obedient. And until you come and, and if I'm and I'm obedient, then I know that I'm going to do my best to reach the lost that are out there and to bring them to church, to invite them to church, to get them saved in the line going through the grocery store excuse me, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I love making my kids uncomfortable when I'm in a grocery store. It's funny, sometimes I turn around and they're gone. Where are you going to go, you know? I'm set apart. We all are set apart. He wants to clean us. And this preparation was so critical for the people that we need to understand that too. Because that was what was about to happen. It wasn't going to happen unless they cleansed their heart first. Unless they sanctified themselves, consecrated themselves. God's work wasn't going to be accomplished. Could it be that we don't see mighty acts of God simply because we don't prepare for them? Are we prepared for them? We pray for miracles. Are we prepared for them? We pray for a growing church. Are we prepared for it? I've been on the board in, the, in a nice way. I don't mean that. This is something silly, so it's not nothing bad. But I said, we need pens in these seats. 
My sister couldn't even fill out a card because we don't have a pen in a seat. And the board's like, yeah, we need pens in the seat. I like a board like that. <laughs> yeah, we do. See, the pastor needs a new car. No, I'm just kidding. That's not. <laughs> he doesn't. I'm blessed. Praise the Lord. But see, the, the board's willing to listen. See, are we prepared? We're not prepared. And some things, so the church is getting more and more prepared. We're getting prepared because we're not going to let things stand in our way. And then about how much money we have in the bank because we can't take money with us in heaven. How many, if we have a million dollars in the bank and we have 500 people here and no one coming to the Lord, we're failing. Praise the Lord that we can use these things to build his kingdom. To build his kingdom. That was for free. I don't know where I'm at now. <laughs> Consecrate yourselves, he said. Consecrate. You know, we tend to say, God, you do something great, and then I'll respond. You know, God, you, you, you act powerfully in my life, and, and, and I'll get serious with following you. But look here. God says this. No, you get serious and follow me and watch what I do for you. We get it backwards, you see. Oh, Lord, if you do this, I'll do that. No, Lord says, you do this, and then I'll do that. Get it straight. You've been seeing some mighty acts in this church. You have seen. And you will continue to see mighty acts. Did I lose my power? You'll continue to see mighty acts of the Lord moving in this church. I believe that wholeheartedly. He's not done with us. He's not through with us. But I wonder, as we wait for him to continue to do more gracious things for us in this church, I wonder, thank you, I wonder if we're prepared for him. Testing. Can you hear me now? Well, that's old, but it's still good. Are we ready? Are we prepared? I wonder, would we see even more mighty acts of God's Holy Spirit in his work here if we intentionally consecrated ourselves? What would happen if we prepared ourselves and expected Expecting to see God move in our services. I come through that door every time expecting to sense his presence and to expect his movement and to expect something to happen. I want to be in his presence. I want to be with him. And you know, I, I want to be more of him. I'm just greedy. I want more and more of God. I want more of him. And he says, listen, you want more of me? You get more serious about me and I'll give you more. Praise the Lord. He loves to give us more of his presence and more of his power. But unfortunately, we forget to tap into it because we're all wrapped up into ourselves. Well, I believe God calls us to different things and different times in our lives. But I also believe it also includes some basic things. For example, some of us may, may need just to simplify our lives. We got so much going on. I am so stinking busy. <laughs> I think that's one of the devil's tricks. The busier he keeps us, the less God has of us. I'm convinced many of us are just too busy and command such a full active, active schedule that we can't even hear God speak when he speaks because we're so busy. And I'm as guilty. I'm just as guilty as the next person. I see more and more the need to eliminate some things from our lives that are excess. And then I can have some more quiet time with my Lord. Then we can be quiet. We can quiet ourselves long enough that we can hear him and he can direct us and he can shape us and mold us. A large part of this is prayer. We've got to talk to God. Prayer is important. What would it mean for prayer? To truly be the very center of our lives, of our spiritual lives, of our health. I believe we would be more spiritually healthy if it became more central and if we corporately would be that way our church is going to be more spiritually healthy the primary question is not only about the discipline of prayer though it's about our hunger it's about our thirst like i was trying to explain i can't wait to get here and i want more click there for me brother psalms 42 1 yeah, it's become one of my favorite verses lately i don't know since a wednesday night as the deer pants for the streams of water so my soul pants for you my god 
Are you hungry to see God move? Are you thirsty to see God move? Are we thirsty to know him better? Are we thirsty to know his power? Are we thirsty to know his presence? Moving towards this hunger and this thirsty thirst after righteousness, you see. It's part of how we consecrate ourselves. And this helps us prepare ourselves for some mighty acts of God. Now, there's a third action here. And these people were called to do. And I'll confess, this makes me a bit uncomfortable. Hang in there to talk about it. Because because it sounds like it's about me. But it's not if you stay with me. It is, but it isn't. But uh, the more I read about it, I was telling Stephen this morning, you know, the Lord was shook me up yesterday. And he put me on the computer and I ended up changing this whole thing. Because it's such a part of the text, I try to run from it. But it's so clearly a part of the text, I couldn't ignore it anymore. I gave in to the Lord. So besides following God and consecrating themselves, the people were told to follow the leadership. Follow the leader. Remember that old game, follow the leader? When we were young, we follow the leader. We are to follow the leadership. Very often the way God takes us to new places in our spiritual journey is through spiritual leadership of those that he's placed in our lives. I'm not here by mistake. In this case, in this case in Joshua, it was pretty clear. God clearly said to Joshua, I am going to exalt you in the eyes of the people, and I am going to show myself to them through you. I'm going to direct them through your actions and your mouth. Now, that's a tall order. But throughout the history of God, dealing with his people, that's how he directed them. They were to follow Joshua and to follow the priests who God appointed to lead them across that river. Now, this is hard for us. Again, it goes right back to the same point. We've learned to be very independent. We've learned to be individualistic in our faith. We aren't taking orders from nobody. You're not going to tell me what to do. But the truth is, based on the consistent witness of scriptures, the leaders of the church have been placed there to, to give spiritual guidance and leadership to the people. Not just as pastor. Not just as pastor. But those you have appointed and prayed over and set over you, over this church. Through your prayers, through your votes. We're coming up on voting. You know that, right? A little bit of a typo in the bulletin. We're voting on a new seating chart and you'll understand it better in a couple weeks and ask any board member they'll do their best to explain it as we as a board and as a church look to the future but God may have put them on your heart through prayer a committee has pulled them together through prayer you all have voted for them through prayer maybe fasting you said yes or maybe you said no but you are the ones that have appointed them over the church. And at the risk of sounding terribly misunderstood, may I suggest to you, perhaps the reason some aren't growing in their relationship with the Lord is because you aren't following or listening to your leaders. Now, before you go taking off with that idea, please hear me out. I am not saying I am holier than thou. No, I'm like Paul. You know, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I was one of the worst sinners there was. I'm no better than you. I'm not saying that your leadership is infallible in their knowledge or their wisdom. That's not the case. I'm not saying that you should never challenge your leadership or you should disagree. If you disagree, you disagree. That's okay. But I am saying here one basic reason to be the mouthpiece. I am here. For that reason, that basic reason, and that is to be the mouthpiece of God in the place, in this place, amongst this people. Please don't misunderstand me. Please don't un misunderstand me. I'm here as a priest. I'm here as an apostle, as a shepherd, as a preacher, because God has called me here, and you have voted me here. I'm here to proclaim, thus says the Lord. I promise you, I never stand in front of this pulpit without having gone before the Lord. I promise you, and yesterday was a great uh, example from, from, from 8, 9 in the morning till 7 at night. I did nothing but work on these messages, because I take it so seriously. I plead 
plead with God to speak to me, through me, though you may hear. Those that are here that need to hear the word, that they hear the word, whether it's for one or for many. It doesn't matter. I plead with God to speak to me and through me for you. And my type of personality consistently over-prepares. <laughs> for every service, I do more than I should. And that's why we've already been here 10 minutes longer than we should. <laughs> because, oh, back that up for a second, though. Thank you. Who's speaking through me? I hope it's the Lord. I don't think I've said anything of the devil today. I sure hope not. You see, I... What level of obedience would I be showing... If I didn't cross over into these three actions, especially after the Lord has told me to, what kind of an obedient person would I be? I promise the Lord that I am, uh, I, that I would never work up here alone. And I promise you that I am not working up here alone. And I praise the Lord that I don't have to work up here alone. The Spirit of God is present, and the same Spirit is present and active in this place. He takes words that God has given, and He delivers them to you. God clearly designed it, and God clearly designed it so that Israel, if they wanted to cross over successfully, they had to follow their leaders. First of all, God, always God, yes. Then Joshua, no, it wasn't Joshua, it happened to be the priests. It was the priests, his servants. You see, we've got to follow God, and then we've got to follow his servants. It's no difference now. I say to you as a pastor with an awesome sense of what this means, follow me as I follow Christ. When the truth of God pierces your heart, don't write it off because it came through these feeble lips. You listen to God and follow the leader. Well, the Israelites put these three actions into practice. They watched the Ark of the Covenant, went on before them, and they followed it. And they followed God. They consecrated themselves by cleansing their hearts from sin. And they followed their leaders as they took the Ark, and they stepped into that swollen rivers of the Jordan, and it dried up. They watched in utter amazement, and as those waters stopped up, they were amazed as they crossed over the promised land to that promised land on dry ground. And they knew God was with them. They learn the lessons again. When God calls you to something new, when God calls you to something deeper, when he invites you to cross over into some new land or new call or, or a deeper spiritual walk with him, he will never call you where he will not lead you. And he won't lead you to any place where he is not. He will be there. He will never ask anything of you without providing all you need to follow him faithfully. So again, I ask you this morning, is, the, is there a new land that God's trying to lead you to? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the hunger and thirst in your heart to know Him more? When are you going to respond to the call of God to move on into all He has? Time's come. It's time to cross over. So consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I struggled there, Father. I struggled with that message this morning. It ain't about me. So I'm trusting that your word is always true, and it says that your word will accomplish what you've set it out to accomplish. So I thank you for doing that. Holy Spirit, for those that may need to come and pray this morning, I pray you give them the strength, the courage to do so. Lord, if no one wants to come, that's, that's fine too. Speak to their hearts and their lives, Lord. May the, the time that we've offered you today, well, we just ask that you would anoint it, that you would speak to our hearts and minds throughout this day. Make a change in our lives, if, if you so call, that we may be even closer to you. Help us hunger and thirst after you even that much more. We'll always praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Scott. We hope you enjoyed the message this morning, and we'd like to invite you to come and join us here in person at Christian Life Church on Parton Settlement Road in Kissimmee. We ask that you would pray for us, and we will pray for you. If there's anything that we can do for you, let us know. We love the Lord, we love to worship the Lord, and we're here to serve Him. So join us. If you don't have a church to attend, we'd love to meet you and love for you to become part of this family. God bless.